wonder if you can answer a few questions for the people of Leicester and what you understand about the new local lockdown. Because it doesn't just affect the people of Leicester. This has been done on behalf of the whole country, hasn't it? Because we know that um, this might be something, this might be setting a precedent for something that might happen elsewhere in the UK. Um, we have a comment on Twitter which illustrates, I think, some of the confusion over what's happening in Leicester. Daniel says, why are the government waiting until Thursday to lock down Leicester if they know there's a rise in the virus? Now, as far as I understand, schools locked down on Thursday and the easing of the hospitality lockdown on Saturday won't go ahead. But what do you understand about what specifically affects Leicester and when? Good morning, and it's really good to be on the programme. Um, I understand there was actually a debate about this last night where my colleague, the Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, was posing, in fact, some of these questions uh, around exactly how that local lockdown would work. I would very much agree with what was said, actually, in the previous segment of your programme, where it was pointed out that actually the local health service, public health actors are, I think, really trying to get a handle on this. Um, I know that they were asking for that information about where the infection was for really quite some time before they got that information. But now that they have it, it's my understanding that they've rapidly ramped up that testing capacity, as you mentioned. Um, and my understanding of that kind of additional lockdown is very similar to what you said. But I would say to anybody who is watching this programme from Leicester, if they have the chance, please do look at what Jonathan Ashworth was asking about last night. And hopefully uh, Matt Hancock will have provided some responses on some of that detail that people might need. Yeah. Um, yeah. Schools <laughs> on Thursday in Leicester will uh, get shut down. Uh, com completely, I think, apart from uh, critical workers and vulnerable children. Um, it's an issue, isn't it, the whole schooling issue? And it's a particular issue for the Labour Party um, because the rest of us parents, um, you know, when we look at that, we think, well, actually, you know, schools aren't opening at all, the rest of the country, until September, apart from those uh, key children. Why is the government being so slow on opening schools? And why is the Labour Party pushing that opening much more strongly? Well, we have been, and in fact, consistently, we've said that we want children to be able to go back to school. But right now, we have a really very difficult situation, I would say, across England in particular. I mean, the schools seem to be going back in, in a planned, agreed way in Wales. But in England, we have a situation where actually there isn't that agreement, there hasn't been that process with the trade unions in particular. Now, you know, Keir Starmer said to Boris Johnson, look, let's privately work together on this. Let's try and get all the different actors in a room, get this sorted out. Because the problem now is that there's been a lot of distrust created in the process. We don't have the extra space there that's needed. And yet we've actually got lots and lots of buildings that are sitting empty. You know, there are creative ways to sort this out. The trouble is, and, I, and I go to... Back to, I'll go back to the situation in Leicester again, what we see is local flare-up spikes, perhaps in workplaces, perhaps in certain parts of a city. And as a result, the school children pay the price. They're the one, you know, the schools then shut down as a result. And yet we know school children in particular are probably at the lowest risk of getting the virus. Meanwhile, the, apart from Leicester, the rest of the country is seeing pubs and restaurants are going to open up on Saturday. They're going to see, you know, holidays opening up. We can all get on a plane. We can get on a plane, but we can't get into the classroom. Do you think the priorities are wrong here? I, I do think that government has not devoted remotely enough effort to sorting out this school's situation. And of course, it's not just the impact on the children, as large as that is. It's also the impact, of course, on those parents who have to care for children who are not in school. That's having a particularly severe impact on many single parents, obviously, and particularly on mothers. And we already see more women being furloughed. Many more women will be likely to become unemployed because they're having to look after children for a much longer period and not able to access other forms of childcare a lot of the time either. So this is a very, very difficult situation. We need to have creative responses to it, not ones 
which seek to sow division. You know, we had a bit of that initially. Actually, the day after those schools closed, we should have started the strategy for reopening them. That's what we were urging on okay, government. You talk, about, it, um, time... you talk about division. Sorry, um, and we've got this interesting situation involving the former Shadow Education Secretary, Rebecca Long-Bailey, who should have been handling all this for the party and has had to be sacked because uh, she retweeted an anti-Semitic... Uh, uh, p interview in the in the Independent. Uh, what's interesting is she's written a piece in the Guardian today, Rebecca Long Bailey, in which she writes over nearly a thousand words. Never apologises. Says I never meant to hurt anybody with my tweet. Uh, do you think she should have been sacked? Well, I think it was right that Keir took decisive action over this. I mean, what was repeated was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. There's no room for them. I mean, it was, a, it was a really bizarre statement. But unfortunately, we see those kinds of horrible conspiracy theories circulating and we need strong action against them. So it was right that Keir decided that she should not continue in her current and do, do you position. think Rebecca Long-Bailey is anti-Semitic then? Um, no, I personally don't believe that, that she is, actually. I think that she, however, circulated something which was well beyond the pale. I think it's absolutely right that resolute action has been taken in relation to that. You know, when people do things like this, there have to be consequences. When that kind of behaviour takes place, there must be consequences. Should they, I don't say, think should they say sorry, do you think? I mean, she can't seem to bring herself to say the word sorry, even though the piece that she retweeted so gleefully implied that it was the Israelis who were behind the murder of George Floyd. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more anti-Semitic trope than that, and yet she just can't bring herself to apologise. Well, obviously, the fact that trope was in there is why Keir took action. I mean, ultimately, um, what Becky says is, is up to her. I think it's very important that resolute action was taken by the leader of the Labour Party to deal with this situation. And I think it's very, very important that we have a leader who will take that kind of no, I get action. That, but should she, should she apologise and should she delete the original offending tweet, which is still up? Well, it's my understanding that is what she was asked to do. So I think that would be uh, uh, the right course of action. But look, that's up to her. The core thing, the core important thing for me is that we have a front bench for the Labour Party which is one which is disciplined, professional, and particularly one that's focused on the crisis that we're all going through, still going through right now. Okay. And I think Keir acted absolutely correctly to deal with that situation. OK. Um, Boris Johnson thinks he's the new FDR, the new Roosevelt. Do you agree with him? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't. I mean, obviously, I'm pleased that government is waking up to the need for additional infrastructure and investment. Quite a number of what is being proposed, a number of the different projects have actually been announced some time before, but at least if they're going to be happening now, that's encouraging. But you know, what we really need now is a very, very strong approach against unemployment. We've called for a back-to-work budget. It's now looking like we won't even have a budget statement. We'll just have some kind of an economic update. I am really concerned about that because we're seeing a really, really big additional spike in unemployment. It'll get worse unless we see more action from government. I mean, well, that I mean, is... Isn't that the point? Shouldn't, shouldn't jobs be the priority here, the number one priority? We all know when the furlough scheme ends in October, we are going to have mass unemployment in this country. And Boris Johnson, you know, boasting about his fantastic new investment into infrastructure seems to grate with a lot of people who know they're going to lose their jobs and livelihoods. Mm. They want to hear how their jobs are going to get saved. Absolutely. And that task of preventing additional unemployment seems to have been a blind spot for this government. I mean, we've been calling on them since they announced the changes to both the furlough and the self-employed schemes not to take this one-size-fits-all approach of withdrawing it at the same time for every different sector of the economy. You know, I appreciate that schemes can't stay as they are in perpetuity. You know, they are expensive schemes, but we need to be making sure that that support is there for those people who simply cannot get back to work in the same way that others can. Yeah, there's also going to be a lot of them, I think, I'll, I'll, put, I'll just put it a slightly different way. Um, the government did spend a huge amount on the furlough scheme. It, it would argue that it's gone out of its way in terms of the billions that it has done to support jobs. 
And it is planning to build, build, build with jobs and infrastructure its way out of this crisis. I mean, you know, you make Carpatic criticise it, but actually they've sort of taken a leaf out of your book, haven't they? You know, after 10 years of auster austerity, suddenly they're putting the billions that the Labour Party might have promised in your manifesto back into the economy. Well, look, I'm not interested in carping or criticising. What I want put in place is those policies that will help to prevent people from becoming unemployed in the first place and then rapidly help people who become unemployed. And, you know, if we look at what other countries are doing and what the evidence tells us, that first step of stopping people becoming unemployed in the first place is absolutely critical. Once people have become unemployed, that has a scarring impact on them and on our country for decades into the future. So what I'm saying is to the government, and I've offered this in the spirit of constructive opposition many times, I've said to them, please shift course, do not continue to have this one size fits all approach because that will inevitably lead to much greater unemployment in the future. Do what other countries have been doing to keep young people in education and training for longer, to keep them out of that pool of unemployed people. Put the support in place for those who become unemployed. We don't have to remake the wheel here. We've got, for example, the Future Jobs Fund that was taking place previously 10 years ago. That worked pretty well to get people back into work. And then where we do have investment, which you're absolutely right, we have been calling for much of that investment, much exactly of it's been promised right. already. So I'm pleased that it's happening. But make sure that that investment actually delivers those jobs that will be needed, because that's the enormous crisis that's facing yeah. our country well, right now. Well